Hello and welcome to the Mountain Gazette Library. I'm John Buzar, and this week we proudly present the writings of American rock climbing pioneer, adventurist, entrepreneur, and writer, Royal Robbins. Enjoy, enjoy the great American West, what's left of it. October on top of Half Dome, the whole Sierra was blanketed with a foot of snow. On it. I had just entered a pleasantly empty subway car. And the next thing you know, you're in this calm, calm water. When you know who you are, when you get in touch with yourself, you don't have choices. So I think as a journalist right now, you have a lot of opportunity to really put across quality work that will stand out in a sea of a lot of garbage. If I've learned anything about life balance, it would be that the no balance balance is where it's at. <laughs> Episode 2, A Dream of White Horses by Royal Robbins from Mountain Gazette 28. A Dream of White Horses one of the great names fulfilling Jeffrey Dutton's dictum that a name should tell you something about the climb or photograph explains it. That great sheet of spray leaping from the sea, rearing from excited waters like a splendid white stallion, and the two figures fastened to the rock just out of reach of the tormented foam. With its whimsical and romantic overtones, the name appeals more to the American climber than his British counterpart. A dream of white horses, Drummond, who made the first ascent with Dave Pierce, has a talent for verbal imagery, for metaphorical and poetic phrasing. It's not surprising he should produce such a name. But still, a dream of white horses, five words, turgid with subtle meanings. One of the few long names that succeed, although I knew nothing of the climb, because of that name and that sensational portrait by Dickinson, it was a route I had to do. A chill, heavy wind flowed from the North Atlantic beneath dark masses of cloud, not rain-laden, but casting showers on the soul, dampening the urge as we stubbed in tight shoes across the barren, heather-covered crown of Holyhead Mountain. The green sea was agitated. Lots of white horses today, said Wiz. Yeah, verily, I replied, suspended in heavy-handed mockery between Shakespeare, St. Paul, and Zane Grey. Tis a right stampede. You know, you shouldn't try to be clever, my friend advised. He has my best interests at heart. You lose points that way. You don't have any judgment about what's clever and what is merely cute. You'll probably put something like that in your next article. You're one who should not digress in your writing. The way you ought to write this, open your story in the middle of a pitch, write about that for six pages, and close with the hero, yourself presumably, ten feet higher. Then you might have an article that people would read. Thanks, pal. I'll let you know what's wrong with you too, as soon as I figure it out. We were soon at the edge, and I was startled by how sharply the green and brown dipped towards the sea. There was a break in the clouds, and the sun rested. We came across ropes and packs left by others. Wiz was concerned. They're doing the same thing we are, he assured me. They've uh, just gone down to check out the wind and wet. We can beat them if we get on the route first. He talked in his unique and entertaining fashion about the likely identity of the others and about how they didn't know the code for they had parked in the wrong place. Then he digressed to other subjects, political scandals, rock music, architecture, climbing techniques, photography, and the organization and conduct of international mountaineering expeditions. Wiz is an authority on many things delivering quick, sometimes harsh judgments, dogmatic, impulsive, abrasive, but often accurate, he is very much alive. So alive that he seems, at times, about to burst with suppressed energy. A weaker man might have drowned that much painful life force in a sea of bitter, but Wiz has it pretty well harnessed. He is irritating at times, but inspires respect and somehow even a certain affection. But he is a steamroller on the bumpy road 
of sentimentality. A wine crusher of maudlin grapes, impatient of weakness, scornful of incompetence, not overworried about people's feelings, a skillful and agile pulmacist who usually wins. He comes on strong and sometimes puts people off with his aggressiveness, but he is not impervious to a slight or to a well-chosen phrase focused upon a weakness. And he is keenly sensitive to the nuance of status, insisting upon his turn in the front seat. Let's just whip over there and set up the ab, said Wiz, tripping off. But first, I wanted to look at the route, so I scrambled down the steep slope. Four climbers were coming up. What are you going to climb? One shouted through the wind. White horses, I threw back. That's what they're doing, he replied, indicating two figures on the wall halfway between water and grass. I continued down to a promontory which curved and faced the climb across an impatient, foaming gap. Sea spray was dashing against the wall. What a picture. What a time to be out of film. Wiz was waving wildly over the shoulder of the slab. I surmised that he deserved my presence. I knew he would be thinking, we mustn't let those nods get ahead of us, except for occasional uses of twit or Freddy, whiz to express disdain, favors words starting with N sounds, words like nod, gnome, nerd, knob, nibbler, etc. I arrived to find him taking great care in setting up the ab angst. A close friend had recently been killed abseiling and whiz, and whiz didn't want to go the same way, and nor did I. This is a dangerous place, I said clipping the two millimeter runner he had looped over a sturdy block and backed up with two more anchors. We were now directly above the copulating waters. Wiz threaded the ropes through his brass figure eight and was off. The place provoked me in the same feeling I get descending to the notch of the lost arrow spire in Yosemite, with the prospect of falling into the arrow chimney. In such places, the recurrent theme of abseiling that once eggs are all in one single basket comes home with special force prompted by the hideous aspect of what one would fall into. I deferred to Wiz, who is waiting on a narrow, irregular ledge, just the sort that someone someday will fall off. Just look, he said in a jocular tone at the tangled and barking ocean. I missed the allusion to Yeats, but his metaphors seemed nearly right. The route properly started 70 feet lower, but as the water was only 60 feet down, we had to forego the pleasures of the first pitch. We were on when slab. Slab, in this case, doesn't mean low angle, for the rock averages about 80 degrees and is vertical, or overhanging in many places. It is a slab that is a single slice of compact rock, forming one wall of zon. A zon is a yawn in a sea cliff, the bottom filled with water. The outside wall of this zon is a promontory that juts into the sea and curves towards the south, a sort of pillar, the top of which is directly across from and halfway up Wen Slab. This pillar is a natural bridge, the waters in their ebb and flow have surgically cut a tunnel through the pillar in an attempt to isolate it and transform it into a sea stack. Through this tunnel, the waters burbled and boiled, forming a counterpoint to the larger boiling flow from the natural mouth into the ocean. I was struck by the savagery of this place, the frothing and sucking, the wind blowing, spin drift flying, the water churning and surging into the cliff, the surges breaking and lapping up the wall to hang like lace curtains while slipping back into the sea. Aphrodite, they say, was born of sea foam. But this was a rough sort of love, this mating of water with rock. It was elemental and affected me as do thunderstorms or raging blizzards. I love the fearful violence of it, in the clash and dash of water, the thundering and pounding, the crashing, breaking in, there was great power, but no evil. It gave pleasure similar to boulder trundling, but touched one's emotions at a deeper level. 
I turned my back to the sea and started climbing, moving vertically, following a crack on the right side of the slab. It was steep, but not difficult. All the same, I slotted a wedge and continued up on toes and fingers. The rock there is good for climbing. It doesn't have holds everywhere, but might have holds anywhere. In this respect, it is like the rock in the Lakers or the Welsh mountains, but it isn't granite. Such rock offers very good face climbing, but is comparatively rare in the United States. Most of the climbing in the USA is on young granite or sandstone and generally follows crack systems. But even in the Schwangunks, where there are few vertical cracks, the complexity of this sort of British rock is lacking in the Schwangunks. There is a certain predicate about what lies ahead. This is not true of places like Craig Gogarth, like a fissostral cliff where it is very difficult to tell from about 50 feet away whether a passage is easy or impossible or from even closer than that. I was 40 feet above Wiz at this point. At that point, the route to reverse left two and half pitches straight off the cliff. I started aiming for a crack 50 feet away. A solution had to be found for every foot of progress. The route was going to yield to an aggressive approach. I advanced tentatively and the rock revealed some of its secrets. I made further advances, careful, but firm, and the rock again yielded unfairly more, exciting me, raising my hope. There was a bit of a struggle, a setback, renewed onslaught, and I broke through, confident now and eager for success. But I stopped cold, false hopes, the damning disappointment of hope too soon. The next bit was difficult. Should I take a chance and push forward? No, I would have to find the key. I was almost ready to give up. I considered it. But what would Wiz think when I admitted that I couldn't handle this bitch? Where was the fire? It was cold and shady slab with the constant cold wind and the water running down over the holds. The climb was proving cold and contemplative, leading me on acting easy, then closing the door in my face. Rebuffed, I knocked again. My eyes scanned the rock, noting every detail. I could take a high line or a low one in an effort to traverse to good jugs and a crack. I chose low way and descended a bit, fingers feeling the rock sensitive to every minute variation of texture and contour. I had to be careful, for I was now committed. There was an awkward piece before reaching the crack. I had to restrain myself, to hold back from lugging to escape the tension. But I was getting sick and tired of fiddling around. Finally, I found the key. I moved into the crack and up a bit to Belay, where I was to spend the next hour suspended from two chocks and a spike. I took the rope. Okay, come on. He came up neatly, not fast, but controlled and competent, and soon reached me. Found that troublesome, did you? He asked. Rather, I admitted, but good. Real rock climbing. I led that last time, he continued, and I dare say I found it a slight easier than you did. That's nice, I responded. That's why I came to Britain, you know, to ease the inferiority feeling of your D-team men. Wiz always insisted he's strictly D-team. He's kind enough to classify me as B, so it greatly pleases him when he climbs better than I do. Well... There's a lot to be said for age and experience, said Wiz, encouragingly, but I've yet to learn what it is. Leaving these words of wisdom to rattle around my head, the mountain grabbed the next lead. It was classic. I longed for my camera. Wiz followed a flake and ran up left, offering good grips, but light on the feet except for friction. It was vigorous climbing, different from my tippy toe balance lead. The protection wasn't brilliant, but he made quick work of it, and then it took a long while arranging his belay anchors. I followed the flake, descended a bit to Wiz's belay, and took a gander at the last pitch. I would not have guessed it that way. It looked like rubble, but not so much rubble because rubble implies angularity. It was more like Delinean rub, rubble gone soft like Dolly's watches. 
rubble that had melted and then refrozen, a great dripping molasses of melting vanilla ice cream, refrozen in its slopping and plop ping descent into the sea. Frozen magically hard. It was uncanny the way some force had cemented those sand grains. First it was sand, then sandstone, and then it was heated and squeezed into super sandstone quartzite. Picture the outer walls of a sandcastle a wave has overrun. The soaked edifice crumbles and melts, but the case is well caught in mid-melt and re-hardened into extremely durable battlement. The traverse proved a rare treat. I climbed slowly, savoring it. Wiz gave me pointers on the double rope technique. Above, the rock overhung, forcing a leftward passage. It overhung below as well, so much so that an unroped climber slipping from the traverse would fall 200 feet directly into the water and perhaps escape serious injury. I finished in dazzling sunshine, hot in a heavy sweater. Before disappearing up the grass to a ballet niche, I looked back along the double ropes across the climbing wall to Wiz, who had been enjoying my enjoyment of the rock. It was spectacular, and the rays bouncing off the white rock made me squint. White rock, white horses, this route will be a classic. Wiz walked up the green hill and took off the rope. He coiled it and packed our gear. Let's go said Wiz, his eyes suddenly lighting up with boyish enthusiasm. I know a great place near here for trundling. We rushed off eager for more tumult, forgetting it in our haste to retrieve the runner and carabiner we had left for the dreadful Absu. The Mountain Gazette Library is produced and hosted by me, John Bustar. For more, head over to mountaingazette.com slash subscribe today and pick up a subscription to the magazine. This podcast is executive produced by Mike Rogge, marketing by Austin Holt, produced by Connor Sedmak, social media by Amy Doran, and public relations by Ryan Rowe. No part of this podcast may be reproduced without written permission from Mountain Gazette and its parent company, Verb Cabin, LLC.